All right, welcome back, boys and girls. Today we're going to look at Chapter 4 of Philip Reeves' Mortal Engines, Book 1. If you haven't already done so, click the like and subscribe button. Also, you can click the notification button. You will get updates when I upload new content. All right, let's dig back into Chapter 4. The Out Country. Silence. Silence. He couldn't understand it. Even when London wasn't moving, there was usually some sort of noise in the dormitory. The whir of ventilators, the hum and rattle of distant elevator shafts, the snores of other apprentices in the neighboring bunks. But now, silence. His head ached. In fact, all of them ached. His body felt strange, too. And when he moved his hands, there was something cold and slimy that oozed between his fingers like... Mud? He sat up, gasping. He wasn't in the third-class dormitory at all. He was lying on a great humpbacked mound of mud on the edge of a deep trench, and in the thin, pearl-gray light of dawn, he could see the girl with the ruined face sitting nearby. His horrible dream of sliding down the fire-blackened chute had been true. He had fallen out of London, and he was alone with Hester Shaw on the bare earth. He moaned in terror, and the girl quick glanced quickly around at him and then away. You're alive then, she said. I thought you'd died. She sounded as if she didn't care either way. Tom scrambled up onto all fours so that only his knees and his toes and the palms of his hands were touching the mud. His arms were bare, and when he looked down, he saw that his bruised body was missing its shirt. His tunic lay on the mud nearby, and he couldn't find it at all until he crawled closer to the scarred girl and realized that she was busy tearing it up into strips that she was using to bandage her wounded leg. Hey, he said, that's one of my best shirts. So? She replied without looking up. It's one of my best legs. He pulled his tunic on. It was tattered and filthy from his fall down the waist chute, full of rents that let the chill out country air through. He hugged himself, shivering. Valentine pushed me. He pushed me, and I fell down the shaft into the old country. He pushed me. No, he couldn't have. It must have been a mistake. I slipped, and he tried to grab me. That's what must have happened. Hester Shaw finished bandaging her, finished her bandaging and stood up, grunting at the pain as she pulled her filthy blood breeches on over the wound. Then she threw what was left of Tom's shirt back at him, a useless rag. You should have let me kill him, she said, and turned away, setting off with a kind of furious limp up the long curve of the mud. Tom watched her go, too shocked and bewildered to move. It was only then when she vanished over the top of the slope, that he realized he didn't want to be left alone here. He would prefer any company, even hers, to the silence. He flung the torn shirt away and ran after her, slithering in the thick, claggy mud, stumbling, stubbing his toes on fragments of rock and torn up roots. The deep, sheer-walled trench yawned on his left, and as he reached the crest of the rise, he realized that it was just one of a hundred identical trenches. This hu the huge track marks of London stretching ruler straight into the distance. Far, far ahead, he saw his city, dark against the brightening eastern sky, wrapped in the smoke of its own engines. He felt the cold tug of homesickness. Everyone he'd ever known was aboard the dwindling mountain. Everyone, except Tester, who was stomping angrily after it, dragging her injured leg behind her. Stop, he shouted, half running, half waiting to catch up to her. Hester, Miss Shaw, leave me alone, she snapped. But where are you going? I've got to get back to London, haven't I, she said. Two years it took me to find it, trudging across the out country on foot, jumping overboard little townlets in the hope it would be London that scoffed them. And when I finally get there and find Valentine, come down to strut around the yards, just like the scavengers told me he would, what happens? Some idiot stops me from cutting his heart out like he deserves. She stopped walking and turned to face Tom. If you hadn't shoved your oar in, he'd be dead. And I'd have fallen down and died beside him. And I'd be at peace by now. Tom stared at her, and before he could stop himself, his eyes filled with stinging tears. He hated himself for looking like a fool in front of Hector Shaw. But he couldn't help it. The shock of what had happened to him and the thought of being abandoned out here overwhelmed him and the hot tears flooded down his face and cut white runnels through the mud on his cheeks. Hester, 
who had been on the point of turning away, stopped and watched, as if she wasn't sure what was happening to him. You're crying, she said at last, quite gently, sounding surprised. Sorry, he sniffed. I never cry. I can't. I didn't even cry when Valentine murdered my mom and dad. What? What? Tom's voice was all wobbly from weeping. Mr. Valentine would never do something like that. Catherine said he couldn't even bring him to shoot a wolf cub. You're lying. How come you're out here then? She asked, mocking him. He shoved you out after me, didn't he? Just because you'd seen me. You're, you're lying, said Tom again. But he remembered those big hands thrusting him forward. He remembered falling in the strange light that had shone in the archaeologist's eyes. Well, asked Hester. He, he, he pushed me, murmured Tom, amazed. Hester Shaw just shrugged it, as off, shrugged it off as if to say, See? See what's really, what he's really like? Then she turned away and started walking again. Tom hurried along at her side. I'll come with you. I've got to get back to London, too. I'll help you. You? She gave a hissing laugh and spat on the mud at his feet. I thought you were Valentine's man. Now you want me to now you want to help me kill him? Tom shook his head. He didn't know what he wanted. Part of him still clung to the hope that this was all a misunderstanding and Valentine was good and kind and brave. He certainly didn't want to see him murdered and poor Catherine left without a father, but he had to catch up with London somehow, and he couldn't do it alone. And anyway, he felt responsible for Hester Shaw. It was his fault that she'd been wounded, after all. I'll help you walk, he said. You're injured. You need me. I don't need anybody, she said fiercely. We'll go after London together, Tom promised. I'm a member of the Guild of Historians. They'll listen to me. I'll tell Mr. Pomeroy. If Valentine really did the things you said, then the law will deal with him. The law, she scoffed. Valentine is the law in London. Isn't he the Lord's Ma Lord Mayor's favorite? Isn't he the head historian? No, he'll kill me unless I kill him first. Kill you too, probably. Shing! She mimed, she mimed drawing a sword and driving it through Tom's chest. The sun was rising, lifting wreaths of steam from the wet mud. London was still moving, visibly smaller since the last time he looked. The city usually stopped for a few days when it had eaten, and some part of Tom's brain that was not quite numb wondered idly, where on earth is it going? But then, the girl stumbled and fell, her bag leg, bad leg crumbling underneath her. Tom scrambled to help her up. She didn't thank him, but she didn't push past him either. He pulled her arm around his shoulder and hauled her up. They set off together along the mud ridge, follow, mud ridge following London's tracks into the east. All right, guys, that's the end of Chapter 4. Let's take a look at what we're going to do for the assignment. Just like usual, we're going to have a discussion that we'll do when we meet together virtually. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with your superpower in this story. Tom and Hester are both stuck not in London, laying on the ground, trying to figure out a way to get back to London. I'm pretty sure that no matter what superpower you picked, it will come in handy in this chapter. After that, we'll look at the vocab. The vocab has two words this time. We have bewildered and runnels. Go ahead and look both of those up because that will help you with your understanding of both the book and the English language. Critical thinking, it says, what is the out country? No one word answers here. It says, describe it. If you describe it as an empty, muddy place, you need to describe some more because there was a lot of description about what the out country was. If you haven't already done so, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and if you would like, click the notification button, and you'll get updates every time I upload new content. Until then, we will see you next video.